So now we're going to talk about currents for a while. And remember, there were four things that influenced the, the currents. And one of the things that influenced currents is this uneven solar heating, right? You get it warmer near the equator and cooler near the poles. So that causes movements of air and movements of ocean. Uh, otherwise, the, the center of the Earth would just boil away the water here, and the, this water near the poles would freeze over if you didn't have currents, right? So uh, what influences currents is this uneven solar heating. And the other thing that influences currents is where the continents are. So if the continents are in the way, it's going to cause a current to not be able to go there. And you can see, for example, this gyre is small in the North Atlantic compared to the North Pacific gyre, which is big. And why is that? Why is the North Pacific gyre bigger than the North Atlantic gyre? Well, it's just because the continents are in the way here, where there isn't any continents in the way. The land isn't in the way. So two things. Um, uh, affect the currents. One is uh, uneven solar heating. Two is the position of the continents. Three is the Coriolis effect. So the Coriolis effect tells you in the northern hemisphere the currents go clockwise or to the right. And in the southern hemisphere the currents go counterclockwise or to the left. And then the fourth thing that affects currents is the wind. And wind is what causes the, uh, the movement of the water in the first place. The wind blows on the water and it pushes it around. So um, those four things. The wind starts the water moving. The water will go until it bumps into land. The Coriolis tells you which way it's going to turn. Okay, And it's that uneven heating that starts the wind blowing in the first place. So those four things influence currents. I'm 100% I'm sure that that's somewhere in the test. Okay. The other thing you need to know about currents, I've asked you to memorize, well, it really isn't a memorize, what's the name of the current that flows along our coast? It's called the California Current. It goes from the pole toward the equator, bringing cold water from kind of up in Alaska area down past Canada toward us. So it's why we kind of have cooler weather here than, let's say, over on the east coast of North America, where they have the same thing, the, the gyres bringing their water from the tropics, come here, from the tropics toward the poles, and so they have warmer water. So let's just compare um, in the Pacific, we'll, we'll go over the gyres. This is the North Pacific gyre, the South Pacific gyre, the North Atlantic gyre, the South Atlantic gyre, and the Indian gyre. And then down here is, this guy has two names, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current or the West Wind Drift, the biggest, fastest, coldest current on the planet. And that's because nothing is in its way. If I had a spherical model to show, you could see the whole Antarctic circumpolar current going all the way around the planet, connecting all the oceans together. So um, other things about currents that you need to know is that um, all these western currents, so currents on the west sides of the ocean, they're all warm. See that? All the currents on the west sides of the Pacific is bringing warm water from the tropics toward the poles. And the northern hemisphere turns right, southern hemisphere turns left. But either way, it's bringing warm water from the tropics toward the poles, from the tropics toward the poles on the west sides of the ocean. Now let's look at the east sides of the ocean. On the east sides, they're called eastern boundary currents. You've got cold water going from the poles toward the tropic from the poles toward the tropic on the east sides of the ocean, from the poles toward the tropic, from the poles toward the tropic, OK? So on these eastern boundary currents are cold and slow, and the western boundary currents are warm and fast, OK? Warm and fast. The fastest uh, warm current is the Gulf Stream, OK? Um, then we did talk about this, and I asked some of you to go to the ocean and experience it. Why do we have air that blows from the sea toward the land in the day and from the land toward the sea at night? Well, that's because the water has high heat capacity. So in the daytime, right, the sun comes out, but the land heats up fast and the ocean stays the same temperature, right? The air above the land rises and the cool wind comes in to take its place. That's why when you're standing on the beach in the daytime, the breeze is hitting you in the face. What happens at night, right? Water has high heat capacity. Land has low heat capacity. That means that the water stays the same temperature, but the land gets really cold at night. 
So the wa air over the water is warmer than the air over the land. So the warm air rises and the cool air comes in to take its place. So that's why at night the breeze blows from the land to the sea. Now I know I said that fast, but and I know you guys are going to pause and you can listen to that as much as you want. So just get the main facts. The main facts is that water has high heat capacity, land has low heat capacity, right? And you also know that um, in the daytime land heats up water stays the same temperature. In the nighttime, land cools down, water stays the same temperature, right? So in the daytime, hot air rises over the land. In the nighttime, hot air rises over the ocean. And either way, the cool air comes in to take its place in the daytime toward you, in the nighttime toward the ocean, okay? So you should be able to kind of understand that concept and maybe write a paragraph about it. Again, I haven't memorized the test. But I'll, I'll look at it before I write the study guide and put those two questions up there, but um, you should understand that and be able to kind of tell a story. I think I already mentioned this, but I'll go over it again. The reason why we have such a nice, dry, pleasant climate is because we get the, our California current comes from the poles toward the tropic bringing nice cool water whereas on the east coast they have um, still going clockwise right uh, a western boundary current that brings warm water from the tropics toward the poles so they have really kind of hot muggy humid uh, uh, climate and that's why the two coasts are so different climate wise okay so now we're going to just compare surface circulation, this lateral motion of the surface water, the currents above the picnocline. And again, I've already given you these things, wind, uneven heating, Coriolis effect, position of the continents are what um, influences these surface currents. But we also decided or d discovered that um, there is some vertical circulation. It's very rare, but it, there is some, and it's called thermohaline or vertical circulation, and that is the density causes that, and the denser water sinks, basically. It's just pretty straightforward, the density. Here's the dog. Hi, dog. Everybody's coming to visit. So, um, dog! That's how you talk to a dog. Anyway, uh, the densest water sinks, basically. Where does this dense water come from? It comes from the poles. So here you've got the North Pole area. When there's ice being formed, that water is really, really cold. The ice pulls the fresh water out of the ocean, so the salt water is left in there, and it sinks. Same thing, here's Antarctica, you can see where the circumpolar current is, Antarctic circumpolar current. Around here, all these areas in the winter around Antarctica, there's these ice shelves all in here and all in here, and there's some ice shelves over here. And what happens is, is the winter, same thing, when the oceans start to freeze over, the ice is a little less salty, so what's left right underneath the ice is really cold, really briny water, and it sinks. It's called thermohaline circulation and creeps along the bottom of the sea floor. So here you've got this really cold, really deep water sinking down and that's how the ocean gets density stratified the surface gets warm then you've got this middle layer and then you've got these colder layers on the bottom and here's your cartoon of it your cold layer on the bottom sinking your intermediate water and your surface zone Okay, so now we're talking about waves, and I mentioned waves just a little bit earlier before when you're talking about coasts. Remember, the molecules of water move in a circle. The wave moves like this in a wave pattern, but the actual molecules of water move in a circle. You should be able to draw the anatomy of wave, the crest, the trough, the wavelength and height isn't in there, but here's the height is the distance between the crest and the trough is the height of, uh, of uh, a wave, and it affects water to half of its wavelengths. So you can see these water molecules moving in a circle this big, these water molecules in a smaller circle, and in a smaller circle, and in a smaller circle, and below about half the wavelength, the, the, uh, the water underneath that doesn't feel the wave. So if there's, let's say, a 10 meter wave, if you swam down five meters or below five meters, you wouldn't feel the wave going above you. Uh, so you'd only, you, you'd only feel it if you were shallower than half the wavelength. So that's a, a deep water uh, wave, okay? 
And we also talked about um, what causes waves. Remember what causes waves? Three things, right? It's the um, size of the storm, which is called the fetch, the size of the storm, the strength of the wind, and the duration of the storm. Three things. So the size of the storm, bigger storm, bigger waves. Uh, the strength of the wind, more bigger wind, stronger wind, bigger waves, and the duration of the storm. So a longer storm, storm that lasts uh, a long time, uh, is going to make bigger waves, right? So the waves are all being created under here. And a fully developed sea, this is in the area of the storm where there's big white caps and all kinds of waves crashing around. And then you'll see out here, uh, away from the storm, the waves are created under here in the area of the fetch. There's this fully developed uh, sea with chop and white caps and all kinds of chaoticness. But outside of the storm, you see the waves become organized, and it, those are called swell. And here's your photograph of swell. So these waves were created in a storm somewhere else, and they moved out and became organized. Um, we also looked at tsunamis, and tsunamis are mostly caused by earthquakes, but they can be caused by landslides and uh, 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 ice, what do you call, glaciers falling off into the water. Hey, stay out of the cat food. He wants the cat food. So tsunami is always a shallow water wave, and that's because the wavelength is so huge. It's, the wavelength is, is thousands of, of meters, uh, uh, thousands and thousands, like 100,000 meters. So um, it's always a shallow water wave, and they really pile up and crash uh, when they get to the shore. So let's talk about shallow water waves and deep water waves. So... Um, We've talked about this a little bit already. A deep water wave is in water that's more than half the wavelength. It doesn't feel the bottom. So it doesn't even matter how deep the water is. It's in deep water. Whereas a shallow water wave is in water that's less th than half the wavelength. It touches the bottom. It gets compressed. Deep water wave, the molecules go in a circle. Shallow water wave, the circles are flattened into ovals. And then when it's really shallow, the water just kind of moves back and forth like this in water that's half the wavelength. The shallow water wave, the speed is determined by the depth of the water. So the shallower you are, the slower the wave is. The deeper you are, the faster the wave is. But once you get into deep water, the speed is determined by the size of the wave. So bigger waves move faster. So here you get your deep water wave. It approaches the shore. It stubs its toe, they say, and the, they flatten into uh, or, uh, oval little orbits, and then the waves just kind of move back and forth like this in the surf zone. And we already saw that one. Um, so now you're just your review of tides, and I did review this in class. The reason why is I just think having these two is confusing, so I drew it together as one. But you can see here's your spring tide where the new moon, I'm sorry, the moon and the sun, whether it be a new moon or a full moon, the tides are added together, so you get this extreme uh, 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 variation between high and low tide, whereas at first quarter and full uh, third quarter, they uh, can't kind of cancel each other out. So you get high tides and low tides, but they're they're not as extreme the difference between the two. Okay, and I did I think I, I went over this pretty well in your lecture. And then you've got your three types of tides, your semi diurnal with one high I'm sorry, two highs and two lows every day, semi diurnal. Your diurnal, which one high and one low a day, and then your mixed that kind of has a kind of a combination of a medium high, a medium low, a high high, and a low low every day. And we have that here in Los Angeles, a tidal day being 24 hours and 50 minutes. And you can study for this class on the Climate website too. Okay, see you later.